Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another um, episode. That's a weird way of framing this. Another uh, video, another lecture for English 372 Sociolinguistics. I hope you guys had a fantastic Thanksgiving break. Welcome back. Hopefully your uh, turkey comas have passed at this point and you're ready to hop back in. We've got a weird kind of week here. So we've got three classes of asynchronous, three more videos this week, and then we're going to cap off the entire semester with um, a synchronous, uh, live, not in person, but still live class on Monday. And that's going to wrap up our semester. So we're really getting towards the end of things here. Make sure everything's working well, technology wise. Yeah, we're really getting towards the end here. So we get to drive it home with some fun topics. Um, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to follow up with what I was talking about in the last asynchronous video, I was talking about the difference between sociolinguistics and linguistics as a field, as opposed to linguistic anthropology and um, subsequently anthropology as a field. So we talked about some of those dif differences in the last class. If you don't remember that or you missed that one, feel free to go back and watch that video. And today what I'm going to do is I'm going to follow that up by looking at a linguistic anthropological study. This is the book Wisdom Sits in Places by Keith Basso, one of my favorites. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about this study itself, although we're not going to talk about tons. That's what the reading itself is for. But more so, we're going to frame it a little bit within um, this linguistic anthropology versus sociolinguistic style discussion. And also just in general, I'm going to give you some uh, take home points of what's different about Basso and what I think we as um, linguists and academics can gain from those differences. He writes in a pretty different way. He writes about different things um, and is basically just kind of all around awesome. So we're going to talk about that as well. It may end up being a little bit of a shorter video today. I say that often and it isn't, but I think this one might actually be a little bit shorter. We'll see. Um, and if that is, that's okay too. Because we're just talking about this study today. That's all we got on the docket. Nothing, not, not too complicated today. Sweet. So Wisdom Sits in Places, like I said, this is a book by Keith Basso um, about the Western Apache people and some of the culture and linguistic habits surrounding them. So I want to talk about what you think, um, but you know, it's kind of hard to do a discussion uh, in an asynchronous video like this. We're going to have to shelf this question um, for Monday's synchronous class when I'll ask this question again. And, There'll be a couple of these questions I hit upon throughout the lecture. I'll still mention them, think about them. So what happens if a question comes up in the lecture? That's a good, that's a good uh, way to frame this point is if a question comes up in the lecture, it means I want you to think about it and we're probably going to talk about it on Monday, a week from now. So depends on when you're watching this, I guess, but on the, la the last class. So think about what your thoughts are here and uh, we'll think about it together right now as well. So I want to start talking about with um, kind of like three or four major points of what I like about Basso and why I have you read this. I like Basso a lot, as I've noted, but I'll try and be a little bit more specific. Here's the first thing I like about Basso. The first thing is that Basso, when you read Basso, his, he is... He clearly doesn't try and remove himself from the narrative that he's telling. He is aware of his own presence and the effect that it has on his research study. And I think that's a really nice example that he paints for us. So he doesn't remove himself. He includes the process a lot. Here, I'll shrink myself a little bit. I know that I'm... Oops, I'm on the wrong one. I know that I'm blocking off some of these words here. Uh, I'll come back later, nice and big. He doesn't remove himself from the process at all. And instead, he brings us along with him. <clears throat> and so I love this quote from this chapter that you read um, about exactly, he's talking exactly about these points. He's explicit about them. He says, my own preference is for chronological narratives that move from interpretations of raw experience to those of experience digested, from moments of anxious puzzlement, what the devil is going on here, to subsequent ones of cautious insight. I think perhaps I see. 
because that more often than not is how ethnographic fieldwork actually unfolds. So there's two points here that we can take home from this. One is that um, this is what fieldwork actually looks like, and that's okay, right? It's okay for fieldwork to start with this um, place of not understanding what the devil is going on here, and then even then not end up in an almighty um, uh, handing down knowledge from on high, I know everything way, but ending up at, I think, perhaps I see, with that humility wrapped up in that is, I think, that really strikes me as something different from a lot of other author, authors. And that I love that Basso, in some ways, gives us permission to admit these things, that we don't know everything, etc. That's number one. That's how field work actually works. It's a lot more uncertain. It involves a lot more fumbling around um, and making mistakes than people give it credit for often. And the second thing uh, that we can take from this quote and from this point is that that's okay to include in the published results, that we don't have to obfuscate that, right? So we have these two points here. We're moving from what the devil is going on here to I think perhaps I see. And what often happens in this is that researchers go through this process from one to the other, and then they only write about I think perhaps I see. And there's a reason for that. I don't, I don't want to um, like uh, lamb based that too much. There's good reason for that. That's where the results kind of come in, right? That's where the understanding comes in. And it's that understanding that you're hoping to impart to your readers often when you're doing this style of writing. But, but what I like about Basso is that he doesn't do that. He doesn't um, eclipse his own work in the result. That's a necessary part of it. And he tells these chronological narratives. And you can see that narrative style in what you've read for today's class as well. And so that's an option, that we don't have to remove the struggle um, and just re reproduce the results, but we can actually include that as an important lesson, as an important part of getting those results. The writing style differs here as well with this chronological narrative. Hopefully you can see that. It's, it's quite different. Um, it tells a story, and um, I like that as well. So another one, I didn't, this isn't one of my main bullet points um, or numbered points here, but another thing I like about Basso is his writing and his writing style. It's approachable, it's relatable, it's understandable, and yet it's still gets at a deep level of understanding without a lot of the, I mean, he uses some technical phrases and jargon in there as needed for his field, but without making it um, intractable and unreadable, which is a tendency in both linguistics and anthropology. He eschews that and instead makes it nice and nice and readable. So you can have I guess this is the this is the point one point five. You can have both readable and deep writing. It is possible to have it be nice and readable and well written and still um, have it impart a lot of wisdom and knowledge within that. It's something that we can drive at. So that's point one. That's kind of a convoluted point one. There's a lot of like sub points in that point one, but hopefully that idea strikes home and hopefully that's something you noticed in during, over the course of this reading itself. So let's talk quickly. Let's see where am I? Oh, I clicked off the screen. One moment. Let me make myself a little bigger again. Why can't I do that? Okay, I'm probably not going to do that. Uh, and then come back over here and we'll keep going. So let's talk a little bit about what's actually happening, what Keith Basso is actually talking about. So he's taking some really cool material as well. He's looking at conversations among the Western Apache that follow a certain, um, not rubric, but a certain pattern, right? Think about our conversation analysis. They follow a certain pattern here. And here's an example that he gives in this chapter. One person says, so you've returned from trail goes down between two hills. Another person adds on to this. So you got tired of walking back and forth. A third person adds on. So you've smelled enough burning piss. And then the guy who they're talking to, Talbert, says, for a while I couldn't see. 
This is uh, deemed an appropriate answer by the first speaker, Dudley, who says, it's true, trail goes down between two hills, we'll make you wise. We'll work together tomorrow. This is embedded in a larger context where this guy Talbert has been kind of a wayward dude for a while. Uh, he's kind of been like uh, into some not so good things and in a bad place in life. Um, and now he's coming back to work and he's straightened himself out. He's figured himself out. Um, and so they're teasing him about, yeah, I mean, that's part of the thing is if, if we read this, if we hear this conversation going on, even in that context, we have no idea as, as um, Basso very eloquently puts it, what the devil is going on here, right? <laughs> we don't know what's going on here. We don't have the cultural knowledge we need to be able to successfully interpret this linguistic act. And that's what Basso wants to provide for us. He wants to be a mediator and translate this in a way that we can understand what social and linguistic moves are going on here and deeper what that says about the Western Apache people and possibly people in general. <laughs> so what is going on here? What's going on here is that in each of these three lines, the interlocutors, these people, Dudley, Charles, and Sam, are referencing pieces of stories. They're um, like legends that are told within, within the Western Apache people. <laughs> so Dudley in the first one, <laughs> mentions a place. This is a place name. Trail goes down between two hills. That's a certain place on uh, near where this conversation is taking place, actually, relatively near. And then the next two, Charles and Sam, knowing the stories that are associated with this place that Dudley just mentioned, Trail goes down between two hills. They know that there's a set of stories which take place at that location. They mention um, various moments from these myths, from these, not maybe not myths, but from these stories anyway. And so there's a story where there's these two hills that the trail goes down between and somebody's walking back and forth, keeps getting distracted, walking to one, walking back, walking to one, walking back again. Um, and so Charles referencing that story says, you got tired of walking back and forth. Another story that takes place at this site is one that involves somebody being chased up a tree uh, and lighting on fire, I believe, and then the person peeing on it. So there's the smell of, of burning pee. That's that one. And Talbert for, then responds, yes, yes, like yes to all of the above. Yes, I, I learned my lesson. This is the tree uh, that's at that site. It's a picture. It's a crappy one. So what we can see here in this exchange is that places are associated with stories that happen to that. That's what's going on in this difference from line one, where a place is mentioned, and lines two and three, where the stories associated with it are brought up. So places and the stories have this integral connection for the Western Apache people, which is important. And going one step beyond that, what happens is that these stories, these cultural tales, are in, uh, um, have wisdom embedded within them. They each tell a lesson, they have a moral to the story. And so remembering these stories is what makes somebody wise. And this is, this is um, independently something that we see in cultures um, all across the globe, right? We tell these morality tales to children often, whether they're fairy tales or whether they're whatever else kind of tales. Um, and they have lessons that we want our kids to remember and um, internalize, making them better people, ideally. That's how that works. And it's the same with the uh, Western Apache here. But they go further. The intense connection between place and the stories that happened there changes this dynamic such that when you see the place, there's a, a kind of an indexical jump here. You can think of it as that. When you see the place, you remember the story and remembering the story makes you wise. You remember the wisdom contained within that story. So there's a connection here. So what happens at the end is that 
seeing these places and being around these places constantly reminds you of these stories, constantly reminds you of the morals to be a better person. So seeing being around the places then is what makes you a better person. <laughs> that attachment to place. And that's why the book itself is called Wisdom Sits in Places, right? It's this intense place connection that's involved here. It's really cool. It's really cool. Um, that's your little brief um, introduction to what Basso is talking about here. Um, Basso goes into much more depth and illustrates this much more eloquently than I could, so I do suggest you read that if you haven't, but that gives you an idea of what's going on. And again, hopefully takes you in a very short time here from what the devil is going on here to I think perhaps I see. So now we can kind of interpret what is actually going on in this story. There, this guy who kind of left the straight and narrow path into some weeds, let's say, some moral weeds. Um, they're saying, you must have seen this place, remembered its stories, and come back to the straightened path through that wisdom. So they're teasing him about that, right? <laughs> that you had to go back and get these... You had to remember these things. For a while, I couldn't see. And then Dudley's uh, kind of on-the-nose remark, right? Trail goes down between two hills will make you wise. It will help. These places will make you wise. They'll bring you back if you get lost. Cool. Cool. All right. So that's a quick summary, like I said, of what Basso is talking about here. Let's, uh, uh, I guess we can talk a little bit more. Just quickly, um... We, Basso also talks about what wisdom is for these people, which is kind of interesting. I really like the imagery that is brought up when he's talking about this, um, which is, of course, the imagery that is um, the Western Apaches, right? I'm seeing it through Basso's work, but what we're actually looking at are Western Apache things. That's important to remember. And they have three conditions, three requisite conditions on being wise on wisdom and they all have to do with various elements of the mind so what you're after if you want to be wise is smoothness of mind resilience of mind and steadiness of mind and they each have a different element that they impart to you which in totality makes one wise so smoothness of mind is they relate it to a cleared space that's why it's smooth think of a cleared field and it's free of obstructions there's nothing in the way <laughs> Okay, forget about your like cognitive science where like brain ridges and surface area are good. No, 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 no. We're not talking about that. This is of mind, not of your physical brain. Resilience of mind is an enclosed space that holds its shape. So here the imagery that you can think of is a tight knit uh, woven basket. Yeah, I guess woven basket that is strong and holds its shape but has a little bit of give to it. And that's what we want our mind to be. We want it to hold together and not be a pushover, not be so influenced from other things. Have a little bit of give, but snap back into shape. And lastly, steadiness of mind, uh, which is like a supportive uh, or accommodating space. And you can think of a fence post for this. It's rooted and firmly grounded. Um, yeah, those are our three elements of wisdom according to the Western Apache people. Let's slip back into talking more about the writing of Basso is, uh, itself and the presentation as, if it was, as opposed to the topic at hand. And we're going to think about uh, no, point number two here of what I like about Basso is that he doesn't pretend that he knows everything. <laughs> it's humility. I talked about this a little bit in point one as well. But I like that he doesn't present the situation as though he has everything figured out. He presents himself as, like he said, in a, in a chronological narrative, as a pilgrim, as somebody traveling from know nothing to know something. Not from know nothing to know everything, which would be different, and certainly not eclipsing that pathway and just presenting himself as know everything, which is a little bit... Uh, unfortunately, perhaps a little bit more common in academics. So he, here's another line that I'd like to support that. Um, he says, it is 
It is, to be sure, a discomfitting business in which loose ends abound and little is ever certain. That's his, uh, he's talking about field work there. So it's a discomfitting business in which loose ends abound and little is ever certain. <laughs> but that that doesn't make it not worthwhile, right? That we can still then make that journey from what the devil's going on here to, I think, perhaps I see. So I like that a lot about Basso. Um, I'm going along with this. Point number three here is that the results aren't about him. He, like I said in the first point, doesn't remove himself from the study. He's aware of his own presence and the effects that it has on his study. But at the same time, it's not, a, it's not about him. It's about the community he's studying, and he's using himself as a sort of proxy for the reader to see and understand things. To see and understand things, again, not about himself or about how much he knows, but to see and understand things about the community he's studying, in this case, the Western Apache. So here, the, here again, a quote, but with ample time, a dollop of patience, and steady guidance from able native instructors, one does make measurable progress. So he gives credit where credit's due. It's not about Keith Basso's understanding of Western Apache people. It's about Western Apache people brought to you by Keith Basso, right? There's a difference in perspective there, which I really like, and I think is important. Cool. He sees himself as a, as a translator Right. He's not claiming credit for generating this knowledge. Instead, he's making this knowledge more accessible to people. And that's different. Do I talk about it here? Yeah. This is a, this perspective on what Basso is doing is different. Even it finds a conflict even within sort of the field of linguistics. Normally, what linguists like to do, and various other sub-disciplines of linguistics, is to create something, to discover something, to generate new knowledge, right? So I have a new theory of syntax, which is going to explain all this stuff, and I created this new theory of syntax, or I have looked at all of the different vowel qualities within this community and I found this, right? That's academic generated information that those discoveries didn't exist before the academic, the linguist found them, before the linguist discovered them, right? It's not that, yeah, hopefully that makes enough sense. There were discoveries. And that's specifically not what Basso wants to be doing or is doing. He's not making discoveries. He isn't. Not even a little bit. He's not generating any knowledge. He's not. Not even a little bit. Everything that he is finding out already existed before he found it out. Everything that he is, it's not, it's, there's no generation there. He's generating the translation, but he's not gen generating the knowledge. And that's a difference in, in goal between studies like this one and uh, a bulk of linguistics studies nowadays. And so one question that this raises. There's kind of a sneaky backdoor question that this raises. Keith Basso isn't hoping to generate any knowledge. Rather, what he wants to be doing is making um, different types of knowledge, like the knowledge of indigenous peoples, more accessible. So what is he doing then? Like, what's the value of a linguist then, if what we're after isn't generation of knowledge, but rather access to indigenous forms of knowledge, or whatever forms of knowledge, pre-existing forms of knowledge, right? If what we're after is an emic understanding of language and culture, Basso, as awesome as I think he was, unfortunately he's passed away, by the way, recently, um, they're not the best 
at what they could be doing, right? Like if what we're after is this emic perspective on native or indigenous ways of, of being and knowing, wouldn't it be better if we could hear that from indigenous people themselves, if they could speak in their own voice on this matter? Eliminating this, the need for this third, kind of like intermediary third party um, person like Keith Basso or a linguistic anthropologist in general, wouldn't that be better? So that's a, that's a question I want you to think about. This is one of the places where I'm raising a question that we're going to talk about on Monday. What's the point of this intermediary if it would just be better to have somebody from the community themselves, somebody, uh, uh, an actual Western Apache person talking about this? That's the question. Think about that for a bit. I'll give you a, a, a quick spoiler because I can't help it because we're not going to talk for a week and I don't want to, I want this to, I want to talk about this a little bit while it's still fresh. Um, but yeah, that would be great. <laughs> the spoiler alert of this is like, wouldn't it be great if these people, if there was a Western Apache person who could tell us this themselves in their own words from an insider, truly emic perspective? And the answer is yes, that would be fantastic. And it's actually a lot of where um, it's become a large goal of people doing field work and um, linguistic anthropology and to some degree sociolinguistics as well is to train people from communities that can then serve as their own liaison into this kind of academic, more um, classically Western world. They can translate themselves and speak in their own voice. That's a, that's a, that's a good goal that people are moving towards now. Still think about it though, because this doesn't exhaust um, the topic of discussion. I think there is value in um, having these researchers and intermediaries in some ways as well. So we'll talk about that on Monday. Cool. cool, cool. I'll make it Not bad. This isn't, uh, apparently I didn't give this one a number, but what I like about this style of research that Basso is engaging here is that it helps us to challenge our own common sense knowledge about the way that the world works. We get very set in our own ways of the way that the world works in one way. And what helps shake us out of that, these assumptions, and see them for what they are, which is assumptions and not essentializations of the way the world works, <laughs> is seeing other people's viewpoints, seeing the world from a different perspective, like the Western Apache perspective on wisdom that we're talking about today. That helps us to challenge these things that we just get so embedded in, we don't even notice anymore. So uh, there's, there's a couple stupid examples here. Um, take a look at this room, take a look at this kitchen that I have in this picture. Um, you've never been in this kitchen before, I'm pretty sure since I just grab this picture off the internet. And what I want you to do is in your mind's eye, step through the screen, step into this kitchen, and you need a fork. Go find me a fork in this kitchen. What, what, where are you gonna look for silverware in this kitchen? Hmm? Think about it. Are you gonna look up here? No, you're not going to look up there. Are you going to look in this drawer? Oh, I don't know if you can actually, I think you can actually see my cursor. Are you going to look in this drawer down here? Unlikely, unlikely. You're probably going to check one of a few drawers. You might check this one, you might check this one, you might check this one. Probably one of those three you're going to check for silverware. Even though you've never been here, right? And chances are you're probably going to be right. This is an example of one of those. <laughs> sort of cultural customs that we don't think about so much, that, that there's no real a priori reason why it should be this way other than we're just used to things being that way. It's culturally agreed upon, which may have its own value and benefit in terms of like making things easier. You know, maybe you don't have to ask as much where the trash can is if you can assume that it's under the sink or something, right? Like not saying this doesn't have worth or anything, but that it doesn't have to be this way. <laughs> 
and that it's assumptions that we make about the way the world is and the way the world works, which don't necessarily hold once we get out of our own cultural bounds. What is actually culturally specific and what is more universal is what we're trying to tease apart a little bit. Uh, the second, oh, I didn't actually include the video. The second uh, kind of funny example I have that is a bit more linguistic has to do with this peanut butter and jelly challenge style videos. This was like a viral thing that was going around for a while. And there's a couple particularly good ones. I'll post a link sometime in our um, Teams chat. But you can you could YouTube it as well, and it would work perfectly fine. Where uh, somebody has to tell the other person how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. That's the goal. So the classic one I'm thinking of. There's a, a dad with two kids, and the kids have to tell him how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. So they give him these verbal linguistic instructions, like put the jelly on the bread or something. So he, then he takes the whole canister of jelly, like a whole container of jelly, and just puts it on the bread instead of taking the jelly out of the bread um, or like put some peanut butter, use the knife to put some peanut butter onto the bread. So then he takes the knife and sticks the handle end into the bread or into the peanut butter, scoops some out and puts just the tiniest little bit on the, on the bread. The silliness and the idea here is that even when we talk to each other, we embed our own conversations with understanding of what the other person wants. We fill in the blanks there that when they say, put the jelly on the bread, we don't take the whole thing and put it on there. We know what the end goal is and we can see that and make assumptions about what they want us to be doing. Um, and even if it's, you know, you could say they're being a little intentionally difficult and you would be right in such challenges, but that helps us to see that the literally what you're saying actually doesn't really match up with what the person is doing. There's a lot of filled in cultural assumption going on in these things. Watch those videos if you want on, the, on your own time. They're, they're pretty amusing, I think. Cool. The last point I wanna talk about for today's class is kind of a weird one. Um, I'll just dive into it, I need to. I don't need to walk lightly around it, is something I've been hinting at and talking about briefly here and there as we talk about BASA. This is a very different production of work than most of the styles of studies that we've been reading so far. And think about like the Bill Above fourth floor study or the Martha's Vineyard one or um, even the Podesva one about um, sexuality and um, voice. They're taking a lot of measurements and they're using a lot of quantitative analysis to make their claims. Basso is not doing Basso doesn't have, as far as I know, it's been a while since I've read the entirety of that book, but doesn't really have quantifications. He hasn't found statistical significance to prove his points here. He's coming at this from a different methodology, with a different methodology, from a different perspective. And what we can see in there is a little bit of what we were talking about last time, this difference between linguistic anthropology and sociolinguistics, where linguistics in general has this bend, this predisposition towards quantitative studies, where anthropology, like we see in Basso, who's an anthropologist, is more qualitative. Again, these aren't hard and fast rules, but they're tendencies within this field. And uh, one of my professors a, a long time ago now told, talked to me once uh, in a memorable conversation about how linguistics has a bad case of science envy um, and that thus they rely on these quantitative measurements so to seem real and sciencey and legitimate as a, an attempt to legitimize themselves as a field They've plugged themselves into this notion of what science is, science then using the scientific method of discovery and 
often leaning into quantification. I had to step back for a second. I've given this, I've talked about this before in years past, but I want to quick acknowledge that uh, it's 2020 and talking about science has become a pseudo um, political issue these days. And so I want to say something quickly to address that is that I'm a scientist um, and I'm going to talk down science ever so slightly and never before have I worried about this, but this year I am um, ever so slightly. But that is not to say that science isn't important and valuable and should be believed. I'm a scientist, so I'm going to tell you straight up. Science rules. Science rocks. Believe your science. That's what it's there for. Uh, but that science doesn't have to be the only way, or, or quantitative science in particular, doesn't have to be the only way forward in situations like this, I th is a, as I think is evidenced by Basso. And that doesn't lessen the value of quantitative science at all, at all. That's not a diss on quantitative science, which is super important and valuable in our civilization and in the world today, but that there's a complementary relationship going on here between qualitative studies and quantitative studies. Because I don't know what, how Basso would quantify his current study, not current, but the study that we are looking at about wisdom sits in places and these cultural habits. It's just a study that is better undertaken with the qualitative methods that he uses. They're complementary. And so we don't want to, we're not downplaying the value, the importance, and the foundational nature of science in our civilization. But we're not also not holding it up as the only valuable way of generating knowledge. Again, that sounds, that sounds weird, <laughs> especially this year. Um, but I hope that, that we can find that balance, that we can strike that balance, and that there isn't, it's not a balance in the sense that like as one weight side goes up, the other one goes down. It's not that type of balance. It really isn't, because as we acknowledge the importance of qualitative studies, it doesn't diminish the importance of quantitative studies. Whatever. I'm going I'm to keep going. Uh, uh, the last question, I think, for real this time, <laughs> the last question for real this time, is tied in with this um, qualitative, quantitative, science, social science, whatever. Uh, dilemma is what gets included within linguistics. And what we often see is that there's this core structure. So what is included in the field of linguistics? You can think about that and pause the video quick. Think about that to yourself. What gets included in there is often in these like core aspects. They're called the core of linguistics, syntax, semantics, phonetics, phonology, morphology. Oh, I should have added pragmatics on there too, probably. I'm going to do that now. That's the core of the linguistics field. And then there's these kind of uh, marginal, not marginalized, that as a connotation that I don't want. <clears throat> but marginal linguistics, like historical linguistics, sociolinguistics, language contact, language fieldwork, linguistic fieldwork, or revitalization, which are kind of secondary fields of linguistics. And we can see a little bit of this mm, kind of science NVE thing and preference for quantitative studies within the field of linguistics showing up here, in which these proper linguistics, core, I'm going to change that to core, I'm going to be just like change my slides on the fly, core linguistics, tend to have more of a quantificational bend, and these ones don't. It's not quite true. Historical linguistics actually has really nice methodology in the comparative method that's, that's described and delineated, and sociolinguistics also uses quantification, but there's still a perception of these differences. And uh, what I want to suggest to us is that if linguistics is the scientific study of language, and it is, uh, then this we can simplify this question of what falls within linguistics. And it's basically this. Does the research have a focus on language? Is language a big part of that research? Yes? Okay, then it's linguistics. Spelled wrong. I must have been in a turkey-based stupor when I wrote these slides or something. 
But there's that's basically a simplification. I don't really care about this core linguistics versus marginal linguistics or the non-core linguistics fields. If it has to do with language, I'm calling it linguistics. That's fine. It could be anthropological linguistics, it could be linguistic anthropology, that's fine. Those are all all in that same field that I want. That I want to call it. Okay, cool. Take home points here, because uh, I got a little rambly here at the end. Hopefully you'll forgive me for that is from Basso, things that we can take home and use in our own studies, in our own views of linguistics, or that the researcher is part of the study and that's okay, and we can acknowledge that. We don't have to um, cover that up in any sense. And in fact, it's actually safer and better if we acknowledge it than if we don't acknowledge it. We're more likely to fall into unaccounted for bias if we erase, if we uh, engage in that practice of erasure and take ourselves out of the picture. Two, I love the humility of Basso that it's okay not to understand everything right away. This is something that applies to research situations when you're doing field work. It's also something that applies to life every single day. <laughs> it is okay not to understand everything all the time. Let that be okay in your lives. It, it, it is to your advantage um, to let that be okay in your lives because you're not going to understand everything right away. It's just not possible. There's too much to understand. You're not gonna get everything right away and let that be okay. And let Basso and work like Basso from super highly thought of, super prolific, excellent top tier researchers saying, I don't understand this right away is uh, let that be encouraging in the way that it should be encouraging. Everybody's in the same boat. Ain't nobody different. Nobody understands everything right away. And that's good to know. Um, and then lastly, a little bit of kind of what he's, what's, what's going on here and illustrating this um, depiction of wisdom sits in places and a different style of wisdom is that we want to challenge our cultural and social assumptions about the way the world works. <laughs> Think about what could be different in the ways that it could be different and allow for other ways of knowing and being within our own lives. Don't think that we, um, within our own cultural bubbles here, have everything figured out just the way it is and that this is reality, that this is like, this is the extent of reality. Reality extends beyond our own cultural borders. Our way of knowing is a way of knowing, not the way of knowing and being. And there are other ones, and we want to be aware of that. And um, we want to also avoid within that sort of um, cultural ethnocentrism of, okay, other ways may exist, but our way is the best way. Like, no, we don't. Why? What? 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 On what grounds? Right? We want to challenge those cultural assumptions that um, we're the only way, or even that we're the best way of of knowing and being constantly be challenging these social cultural assumptions. That's hard work. That's hard to do. It's a lot on our plate, but um, hopefully we're set up a little bit more to take a look at that and to challenge these things. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go away now. I'll see you guys on Wednesday through a video. You'll have, again, two more videos. You'll have one on Wednesday. You'll have one on Friday, and then we'll talk on Monday, and we'll wrap things up. So I'll catch you guys later. Thanks for sticking with me um, through this lecture. I ended a little bit early, so not tons, but a little bit at least. And see you all later. Thanks.